questions, questions orales, the Honorable the Leader of the Opposition. Democratic country is in trouble when the judges warn that the government is putting their independence in peril. Exactly. It's sad to say that the Judicial Council of Canada, led by the Chief Justice of our Supreme Court, wrote that the government, and I quote, put in peril the concept of an independent body that advises the government on who is best qualified to be a judge. Will the Prime Minister agree to stop is unprecedented and unacceptable manipulation of our judicial system. The Right Honourable the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as the Honourable Member knows, under our constitutional system, the naming of judges is the responsibility of the elected executive arm of government. Uh, this government has established an independent consultative process that includes, uh, in fact, a, a, broader rep a broader representation of voices than ever before. We do not want judicial pro process, the judicial appointments process to become a private club of judges and lawyers. That's why we included voices as diverse as victims and the police. Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, it's not about the police. We all respect them. It's about the independence of judges. Mr. Speaker, this independence is not an individual right of judges. The Canadian Judicial Council wrote that the independence of the judiciary is not a right of judges. It's the basis of the impartiality of the bench. It's a constitutional right that belongs to all Canadian citizens. Why does the Prime Minister want to jeopardize this constitutional right of all Canadians? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. The leader of the Liberal Party knows that it's the elected government that appoints judges under our constitutional system. We take that responsibility seriously. That's why we've created advisory committees with more diverse representation than before including representatives of the police and victims. The appointment of judges is not a private club for judges and lawyers. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, let me explain the problem more to the Prime Minister, and I'll read what the Judicial Council wrote. Quote, seven members have a voting right on each committee, four of them chosen by the Minister. The fact that the majority of members is appointed by the Minister means that the advisory councils are no longer as independent or perceived to be as independent from government, and this jeopardizes the independence of the body. Will the Prime Minister stop attacking the independence of the judiciary? The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, obviously the Liberal Party opposes the change we've made, which is to give a police a voice in this process. I'm not surprised, Mr. Speaker, given Given what I'm reading in the Vancouver Sun today, when I read, this is how the Liberal Party makes decisions. The Vancouver Sun has learned that the father-in-law of the Member of Parliament for Mississauga to the block. 
question if that's the preference. The honourable member for Laurier Saint Marie. Mr. Speaker, yesterday, the Pembina Institute showed the federal government that a plan with absolute targets to reduce emissions would make it possible to reduce greenhouse gases from uh, the largest emitters, oil companies. These absolute targets would enable Canada to meet Kyoto objectives. So, times uh, passing, will the government finally set absolute emissions targets? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, this government is the first to commit to reduce emissions nationally and to reduce air pollution as well. That's why we have the Clean Air Act and we have our policy to that end. And I can assure all members in this House that this government does not intend to do anything that will jeopardize our economy. The Honourable Member for Laurier St. Marie. Mr. Speaker, if they truly intend to do that, they should answer the questions we ask. Are they going to set absolute reductions targets. When he talks about the economy, if he wants to involve the economy, it's going to cost between 50 cents and a dollar 16 to uh, compensate the oil companies. When you look at the annual surpluses these companies are making, are they going to put the interests of all Canadians ahead of the oil companies or are they going to favor just those interests of the oil companies? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Once again, Mr. Speaker, this government will put an end to preferential treatment for the oil industry with our changes to energy trusts. At the same time, the bloc leader says this may be possible, but it's the Bloc Québécois and the other opposition parties that voted for the bill calling on the government to def define their program. And that's essentially, Mr. Speaker, what we're doing. We're taking those steps and we intend to propose things to the House of Commons. The Honourable Member for Bois à la Berry. Mr. Speaker, the oil multinationals have made record profits in 2006, $12.1 billion, a 25 percent increase over 2005 and 70 percent over 2004. With such huge profits, doesn't the government think it would be quite justified for the oil companies to contribute between 50 cents and $1.16 per barrel for the cost associated with reducing greenhouse gas emissions? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I indicated quite clearly that oil companies, like all Canadian industries, this government's going to regulate those industries. It's very important. And for industries that can't improve the process, they will have to pay to ensure that uh, better technologies are adopted and to ensure that greenhouse gases are reduced and that we have better air quality. The Honourable Member for bournois salaberry It's time to act. The effects of climate change are all over the place. The money is available. The oil companies have profits. Instead of going into debt to defending the poor oil companies, what does the government, what's the government waiting for before setting absolute emissions targets and creating a carbon market? The Honourable Environment Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I already said this government is going to be the first government in the history of Canada to regulate the industry, not just for greenhouse gas emissions, but also on air quality. All Canadian industries will have to participate in our new system. This is something that's very important. It's true for the Quebec industry, and it's also true for the Alberta oil industry. The Honourable Member for Toronto Danforth. All party committee dealing with climate change is moving at a glacial
pace. In fact, glaciers are melting even faster than this committee's moving. And it's time the Prime Minister told his MPs to get to work and to start to produce some results at that committee. Yesterday, the Pembina Institute very conservatively estimated that it would cost about $1.50 per barrel of oil to clean up uh, the greenhouse gas emissions from the oil patch. That's a cup worth a cup of coffee. A cup of coffee for each barrel. Is that too much to ask of the petroleum industry with its enormous profits? I asked the Prime Minister, what does he think about this eminently sensible proposition for yeah. Pembina? The uh, right honourable the Prime Minister. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I don't know the basis on which that uh, kind of argument was made. I can tell you that the uh, proposal of the previous government was that the taxpayers of Canada would subsidize the purchase of credits by industry uh, internationally. Mr. Speaker, we don't think uh, that's a responsible environmental policy. We think that, we think that the basis of, uh, of regulation of greenhouse gases and air pollution should be the polluter pay principle, and that will be the basis of the plans we bring forward. Here, here, here. Honourable Member for Toronto, Danforth. It's nice to hear the holier-than-thou phraseology, but this government is subsidizing the big oil and gas companies. Yeah. They're perfectly happy to do it, apparently. A VP at Suncor said yesterday that we don't predict job losses or impact on the economy because of Kyoto. Shell has committed to a 50% reduction in their first oil sands project as long as it can be done voluntarily. You know, this industry has no reason to be fighting regulation and rules with the pollution that they're putting forward. How can the Prime Minister continue to refuse to act on this situation when even the industry admits that it's not going to hurt the economy? When is he going to get going? Or on a day when Al Gore is here calling on us to act as Canadians, does he continue to deny? The uh, Honourable, the Right Honourable Prime Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I think we'll take our own decisions as Canadians, but uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I, the, leader, the, leader of the, the leader of the New Democratic Party knows uh, that this government has committed to bringing forward for the first time a compulsory program of regulation of industry for the control and uh, reduction of greenhouse gases and air pollution. and. Uh, uh, I'm not sure that those uh, particular oil industry executives were being quoted in context, but if they were, Mr. Speaker, of course, I look forward to their support when the government announces its plan. The Honourable Member for Etobicoke, Lakeshore. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister has made a absolutely uncalled for attack on the integrity of a member of this House, and in so doing has shown no respect for this institution. My question. Lakeshore. Mr. Order. Speaker, similarly, the Minister of Justice appears to show no respect for the institution of the Canadian judiciary. The issue here is whether they are prepared to listen to what the justices and chief justices of this country are saying. Stop this foolish policy of reverse course. Yeah. Uh, all right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, since the opposition apparently won't let me read into the record what the Vancouver Sun reported, let me just say this, Mr. Speaker, that uh, it's very clear from the Air India families and I think from the police community and the wider Canadian community that we expect the Air India investigation to go forward. It's an important police investigation and nothing in the Liberal Party should interfere with that. The Liberal Party was the one that proposed that passed these anti-terrorism measures in the first place. Rather than playing partisan games in politics, they should pass it again and allow the police to do their jobs. Order. Mr. Speaker, the insinuation of the Prime Minister that this side of the House would put uh, the public interests of this country does not deserve reply. His insinuations do not deserve reply. I repeat my question. Will the Minister of Justice, will the Minister of Justice listen to the Chief Justices of this country, or is he going to get up in this House and say that they're wrong? Mr. Speaker, 
everyone in this country knows, including, including many in the media who don't normally support this party, everyone knows that it was the Liberal Party that supported these anti-terrorism measures. And everyone knows that the entire front bench of the Liberal Party supported those measures until two weeks ago when the leader of the Liberal Party started playing caucus games with the safety and security of Canadians who should be ashamed of themselves. For Wascana. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the Prime Minister's allegations are simply beneath contempt. The Prime Minister has attempted in this House to impugn the character and the reputation of an Honourable Member of Parliament. That is absolutely unacceptable, Mr. Speaker. Does he know that the newspaper story was correct or incorrect? Has he followed due process in making the allegations that he was proposing to make? Will he simply withdraw that character slur against a member of this House and live up to the basic decent standard of the Prime Minister? Order, the right honourable the Prime Minister. Order. Order. Wascana has asked order. We'll have some order, please. We're wasting a great deal of time today. Well, then control yourself. We'll have a little control in here. The Right Honourable Prime Minister has the floor to answer the question asked by the member for Wascana. Order. Speaker, the Honourable Member in question can take up the facts of the story with Vancouver Sun if he likes. But everybody knows... Mr. Speaker, that the Liberal Party has done a complete flip-flop on an issue that is of vital concern to the safety and security of Canadians without explanation. It's inexcusable, and they should reverse their position and get back to doing the right thing. Order the Honourable Member for Wascana. Mr. Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister has just, concerned, has just confirmed that to him, partisan advantage is everything. The truth, the truth doesn't matter. It's the allegation that counts. Never mind what the facts are in the final analysis. He's just proved his devious and deceitful behavior and doesn't pay any attention to the consequences to any Canadian. Mr. Speaker, tell the Prime Minister to draw those allegations and apologize to this house. I remind honourable members this is question period. It's not for allegations particularly. We're supposed to be asking questions and getting answers. And the, getting them on both sides, it seems to me. The right honourable uh, Prime Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, the Liberal Party can choose to ignore, if it wants, what's in the newspaper. They can choose to ignore what they want from this party. What they should not ignore, Mr. Speaker, is the fact, the fact that even the Air India families say that the position that they are now taking will jeopardize the police investigation into the Air India Terrorism Act. The Liberal Party has no excuse for that position. It's an irresponsible position, and they should change that position. Order. The biosafety protocol was ratified by 139 countries and calls for the creation of a legal fame framework that would make it possible to establish liability of multinationals when natural species are contaminated by GMOs. And yet Canada and the United States have not ratified it because they don't want to pay for the damage caused by genetically modified organisms. Canada is one of the fourth largest producers of GMOs in the world, how can Canada refuse 
to back the creation of a legal framework if they do recognize the polluter pay principle. The Honorable Agriculture Minister. I signed the Biosafety Protocol in April 2001. Just to signal our support for that objective, we've actively participated in the three meetings of the parties to the protocol as well as a number of technical task forces. We continue to work with that group to address the legal and technical uh, questions that this protocol has raised. We've not ratified this uh, protocol yet due to the concerns regarding this lack of clarity. As these working groups put this clarity together, Mr. Speaker, and answer those technical questions, we look forward to uh, continuing to support that protocol in the days ahead. Honourable Member for Rosemont, La Petite Patrie. After refusing to apply the principle of polluter pay to the major oil companies, now the government wants to withdraw multinationals producing GMOs from future prosecution or lawsuits. Will the government not admit that refusing to ratify the protocol shows that the government would prefer to protect the interests of multinationals rather than those of farmers and consumers? The Honourable Agriculture Minister. As the Honourable Member has pointed out, Canada is one of the largest users of GMO products, and those aren't used by multinationals. Those are used by our farmers from coast to coast. Mr. Speaker, what we want to make sure is that the regulatory regime that comes forward from this biosafety protocol addresses the technical issues, addresses the safety issues, and Mr. Mr. Speaker addresses, addresses the regulatory issues so that when we sign on to this protocol we'll be able to do so with confidence and our prairie farmers and our Quebec farmers will be able to say we can continue to do business after we sign on. The Honourable Member for Longueuil, Pierre Boucher. The federal government committed to see to it that Afghan prisoners were not tortured and benefited from the Geneva Convention before being turned over to Afghan officials. Will the Minister of Defence tell us why Canada refuses to do like the Netherlands, which have the right to monitor the treatment of Afghan detainees to ensure that they're treated humanely, not tortured, and that their rights are respected? The Honourable Minister of National Defence for detainees was made uh, by the previous government and in that agreement uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross is mandated to visit and monitor detainees to ensure that they are treated in accordance with the standards of the Geneva Convention. The arrangement also recognizes the role of the Afghan Independent Human Rights Commission with respect to human rights and detainees. And last fall, the president of the International Committee of Red Cross said that Canada is scrupulous in notifying the Red Cross when it takes prisoners and hands them over. We are satisfied with the current arrangements. Honourable Member for Longueuil, Pierre Boucher. Amnesty International, uh, Louise Abour, says that extortion and prolonged detention without trial, torture and systematic violation of the rule of law are legion. So, Mr. Speaker, given these troubling findings, what's the Minister of Defence waiting for before putting an end to his voluntary blindness and following the approach of the Netherlands to transferring detainees to Afghan officials? The Honourable Defence Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are in Afghanistan in support of the Afghan government, and when there are lawbreakers who come into our hands, we hand them over to the proper authorities, and I, as I previously explained, they are handed over with all the uh, protections of international laws on, uh, on prisoners. The Honorable Chef. The Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. President. Mr. Speaker, I've been part of this Parliament for 11 years and I've never seen anything as base as what the Prime Minister has tried to do against a member of this House. And this isn't what a Prime Minister should be, so I would ask the Prime Minister to withdraw what he said and to apologize. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, this government is trying to continue anti-terrorism measures that were adopted by a Liberal government and supported by the Liberal Party up until a few weeks ago, in fact up until a few days ago. And it is the Liberal Party, because of its actions, police investigations are in jeopardy, and it's up to the Liberal Party to apologize and explain its irresponsible position to Canadians. 
the Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, at that time some members of the Conservative Party voted against this two uh, dispositions. Oh, so, they voted for the sunset as well. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, this is not the point. The point is that the Prime Minister tried to tarnish the reputation of a member of this House in a so low manner that I've never seen it in 11 years in this Parliament. The Prime Minister must withdraw and he must apologize. Minister of Justice. Order. Uh, the uh, leader of the opposition said that some members of the Conservative Party voted against something about four or five years ago. It seems to me, Mr. Speaker, they have a lot of explaining to do, but they told the Canadian public in, in the last election, Mr. Speaker, that they wanted to get tough on crime and they wanted to increase mandatory minimum sentences. But what have they done? They have fought our attempts to get rid of house arrest for serious crimes. They fought our attempts to increase mandatory minimum sentences. They want to weaken terrorism laws. The only thing they have been consistent about, they've been complaining about police officers every day for the last three weeks. Uh, Mr. Speaker, a Prime Minister is supposed to represent all of this country's citizens, all Canadians, and we expect a Prime Minister to have the behavior of a head of state, and today the Prime Minister said something that is not worthy of someone who is the Prime Minister. Now, it is a good thing that uh, we were there to prevent him from saying it, uh, Mr. Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, will the Prime Minister finally... The Right Honourable, the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, once again, this Prime Minister did not have an opportunity to say anything because of what the Liberal Party was doing. And I would simply say, Mr. Speaker, that because of the actions of the Liberal Party and the Liberal Caucus, we are jeopardizing police investigations relating to Air India and the greatest act of terrorism in Canada's history because of an irresponsible and unexplainable policy where the Liberal Party decided in caucus to vote against its own policy. The Honourable Member for West Montville Marie. Mr. Speaker, everyone will know, everyone who has listened to question period, everyone who reads the transcript from question period will realize what the Prime Minister was intending. That's very clear, and this is not worthy. He's trying to change things. In fact, we even asked him at the outset why he is putting his ideology ahead of judicial independence. And secondly, he is making allegations against a member of this House who has been democratically elected and he isn't even capable of apologizing. The Honorable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, what is clear is that the Liberal Party has no intention of fulfilling the obligations they made to Canadians in the last election. They promised to get tough on crime, they promised to support us on that, and they have done absolutely nothing. With respect to the Prime Minister, his job is there to protect and defend Canadians, and that's exactly what he's doing with this legislation. Honourable Member, Honourable Member for Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm alarmed to hear that opposition parties are threatening to play political games to undermine the new fisheries bill, even though they have agreed that we need to modernize this 139-year-old act or risk jeopardizing 21st century Canadian fisheries. Can the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans assure this House that he remains committed to accountability, transparency and protecting Canadian fisheries and fish habitat? The Honourable the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans. Mr. Speaker, let me uh, thank the Honourable Member, not only for his question, but his in interest in this matter. 
Mr. Speaker, I've never been more committed to dealing with this Act, which replaces one that's 139 years old. Provinces want it, industry wants it, fishermen want it, your unions want it. I hope, with the help of my colleagues, we'll refine the Act to make it the kind of Act that everybody wants. We can do it in second reading and in committee, Mr. Speaker. I'm willing to work with them. If they don't want to do that, they can answer to their constituents. Honourable Member for Burnaby New Westminster. Canada's aviation inspectors understand air safety better than anyone, and they're telling the minister his so-called SMS, self-serve safety, is a literal disaster waiting to happen. These inspectors know what they're talking about. Look what happened to railway safety, marine safety, when oversight was handed over to industry CEOs. Yeah. Accident rates rose and safety plummeted. Yeah. Will the minister listen to those who know best and stop his attempt to turn Canadian airline passengers into cannon fodder? Will he stop playing games with the safety of Canadians? Yeah. The Honourable the Minister of Transport. Well, Mr. Speaker, as a matter of fact, the... the the facts are the following. We are putting in place a systems management system that basically, or security management system, that basically calls upon everybody that's involved in the industry to add on an additional layer in terms of uh, security and safety to those who take uh, our airlines. And in that sense, Mr. Speaker, we are indeed continuing to be the safest airways in, in not only in Canada, but throughout the world. And I call upon my colleague to support these actions. They are good actions for Canadians. Member for Burnaby, New Westminster. Well, the fact is, Mr. Speaker, the Minister is promoting the reckless endangerment of Canadians. Eighty percent of Canada's inspectors say that the Minister's self-serve safety will prevent them from correcting safety problems before they happen. Three quarters of Canada's inspectors believe that a major accident will occur soon. And that the public would lose confidence in aviation safety if they knew what reckless, feckless plans this Minister has. The Minister is putting Canadian lives at risk. Why will he not listen to those who know aviation safety best? The Honourable the Minister of Transport. Well, surely, Mr. Speaker, it's not my honourable colleague who knows aviation safety the best. Indeed, we have been working on this file. We've been working extensively. We are putting in new layers of protection. We are making sure that our inspectors are doing the job. Incidentally, Mr. Min Mr. Speaker, we have just appointed a review panel to look at railway safety in the country. So we're acting, and they're not doing anything. The uh, Honourable Member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister has made two allegations in this House, one against the character and integrity of a member and his family, but second, second, the political insu insinuation that this side of the House would make its decisions on a matter of public policy in order to protect that member. I would ask him to withdraw both of those allegations. <laughs> The Minister of Justice. Order. Point of Mr. Speaker, what is very disappointing, Mr. Speaker, is the Liberal position with respect to the anti-terrorism uh, enactment. This was put in by a Liberal government five years ago. Police supported it. The members of the Liberal Party supported it. The Conservative Party and its antecedents supported it, Mr. Speaker. And to make a change at this time, when police are counting on these weapons to fight terrorism in this country, I don't buy their story that somehow the problem has gone away, that terrorism is as much as a problem. We need it more today than we've ever needed, and they should get behind and support it. Order. Mr. Speaker, Order. a clear question was asked in this House about unsubstantiated allegations. The House deserves the respect of a clear answer on a question that relates to the integrity of a member. The uh, Honourable the Government House Leader. Order. Order. We will have some order, please. The uh, Government House Leader has risen to answer the question raised by the Honourable Member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. We will hear the answer. Order. Mr. Speaker, we're getting into the realms of points of order here, and uh, I think the Member may wish to raise those at the appropriate time. I was in the House. I didn't hear any allegation made. 
I know there was an effort to read an article. I often hear those done by members on the other side. But the real question is why the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore, with all the things he has said about the dangers of, the, of terrorism in this world, and all the positions he's taken, which are far more aggressive than the Anti-Terrorism Act, has now joined his leader in flip-flopping on this issue and wanting to oppose the Anti-Terrorism Act protections that Canadians need to rely on. The Honourable Member for Toronto Centre. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I rise with considerable difficulty given the decorum in the House today. But I believe, Mr. Speaker, it would be obvious to you and all members what caused it. And, Mr. Speaker, I would add my voice to those who would ask our Prime Minister to speak with the voice of Canada, to speak with the decency of politics, to speak with the consideration that this House has always known for one another, apologize and withdraw what clearly was going to be a drive-by smear about a young, honourable member of this House who was seeking to represent his constituents and his country, Mr. Speaker. Will he do the decent thing and speak up? The uh, Honourable the Government House Leader. Order. Order. The Government House Leader has the floor. Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I respect what the, uh, the Honourable Member said about decorum. It would be nice to have a little bit in the House so that we could deal with these issues. But it's a, a very odd situation where we're being asked to apologize for something that was about to happen. I think the Liberals should apologize for what they're about to do. So what they're about to do in terms of the Anti-Terrorism Act, a provision that uh, our concern is that the problem that's facing Canadians is a very serious one. Not a question of games in the House of Commons, not a question of who's calling each other names or, or that kind of thing, but the question of the security of Canadians. It's a very serious question. It's a very profound question. They may be trying to dodge and divert, but the fundamental issue remains. Will the Honourable Member for Toronto Centre. Speaker, that answer, unfortunately, is seeking to move the question away. Mr. Speaker, what I am asking through you of the Prime Minister is to restore the civility of this House, to restore the sense of dignity of politics in our country, to speak for all Canadians and speak for what Canada is about, which is about decency and respect for one another as we seek to resolve essential issues of the day. What we want, Mr. Speaker, is a Prime Minister for Canada, not for partisanship, every day, every day in this House. Mr. Here, here. House Leader. Mr. Speaker, there can be no less partisan issue in this House than the question of the extension of the Anti-Terrorism Act provisions. Hundreds of Canadians have lost their lives in terrorist acts. All Canadians are at risk should these provisions not be extended. The question is not the issue that uh, the Liberals are trying to divert us to today. The question is, why will the Liberals look at reversing themselves on this? Why have they flip-flopped on it? Why are they willing to give up those protections? That's what Canadians need to explain to them. What are you hiding? The Honourable Member for Joliet. Mr. Speaker, when uh, he spoke about, when he presented his budget yesterday, the Minister for Quebec was clear. He said that there should be a change in equalization and the formula should include the 10 provinces and as he said they would take into account their sources of uh, revenue. In his budget will the Minister of Finance give a positive response to uh, this uh, motion which is the consensus of all members of the National Assembly? The Honourable Minister of Finance. I'm sure the member opposite is aware I'm not going to talk now about what might or might not be in the budget. Uh, we have had a very extensive consultation over the course of the past more than one year now, Mr. Speaker, with respect to that issue and, and other issues. We've reviewed all the studies. Certainly the finance ministers and the first ministers have had discussions, and my colleague across the floor will have to wait until the budget, which is March 19th. The Honourable Member for Chaliette, Mr. Speaker, we're, ask, we're not asking the Minister to uh, reveal what is in the budget. He said that the solution that he would put forward to deal with fiscal imbalance would be based on very clear principles. So what I'm asking him is whether these principles will include the rule of the 10 provinces and 100 percent of the revenue of these provinces, including uh, natural resources, whether or not they are renewable. It's a question of fairness. 
The Honorable Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, the principles upon which predictable long-term funding will be based to resolve the fiscal imbalance and, and create fiscal balance will be in the budget. The uh, Honourable Member for Burlington. Mr. Speaker, HIV AIDS affects people from all walks of life in all parts of the world. Earlier this week, the Prime Minister, along with the Ministers of Health, International Cooperation and Industry, along with Mr. Bill Gates, announced funding for research in the into the development of an HIV vaccine. Can the Minister of International Cooperation share with this House the importance of this initiative in regards to HIV AIDS research? The uh, Honourable the Minister of International Cooperation. I'd like to thank my colleague for his question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Government of Canada announced an investment of $111 million in the Canadian initiative to develop a vaccine against AIDS uh, along with Mr. Bill Gates. And this shows our leadership on the international scene when it comes to research and uh, prevention to fight HIV and AIDS and our contribution of $250 million to the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria as well as $120 million that we granted last December to support some 20 projects, Mr. Speaker. For Waskana. Mr. Speaker, the last time the Conservatives accused us of being soft on terror, they were slurring Mahar Arar. Earlier in this House, earlier in this House, the Prime Minister said that if I doubted the particular story of the Vancouver Sun, I could check with the newspaper. Did he not check himself before proposing to use that news story in the House of Commons? Does he subscribe to the view that any old smear will do? And why will the government simply not do the honourable thing today and withdraw that allegation? The Honourable the Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, once again the member is talking about something that he's supposing we were about to say. Uh, had it been said, uh, I suppose the opposition could uh, explain the article themselves. They had an opportunity to do that on the public record. They still have that opportunity to explain it and I don't want to deny that. I don't wish to deny Not that to them, but uh, the real issue is that this is a diversion. The real issue is that the big question of the day is a serious question of the Anti-Terrorism Act and the risk the Canadians are being put at because the Liberals are pulling their support for those important public security measures. Honourable Member for Acadie Bathurst. Last March, Clear Water of Vince Bay, Nova Scotia put around 100 workers into a lockout. In June 2006, they decided not to reopen the fish plant. The federal government rejected the workers' claim of unemployment insurance since there are no benefits during a strike or lockout and the dispute was not over. However, the EI ruling gave the workers full benefit, including retroactive, uh, retroactive payment. But the federal government decided to appeal the ruling. Can the minister please explain to these workers why he is letting them down? The Honourable the Minister of Human Resources and Social Development. Mr. Speaker, obviously it's a tragedy whenever anyone loses their job. In situations like this, there are a range of benefits that are available for people if they meet the standards. 83% of people who lose their job through closures like this uh, ultimately are able to get benefits, Mr. Speaker. But in some cases, there is a dispute. Those uh, disputes are sent to an objective body, to an arms like body, a panel of referees, and ultimately, if it's appealed again to an umpire, that process is now underway, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable 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 Member for Acadie Bathurst. Mr. Speaker, this situation is unacceptable. These workers have received no money for a year and they will now have to wait at least six months because the government is appealing. The message they send to workers is very clear. Not only will we not help you, but we will do our utmost to avoid helping you. The workers and their families deserve much more, Mr. Speaker. Will the minister withdraw the government's motion to appeal because this is unfair to the workers. The Honourable Minister of Human Resources. Now, Mr. Speaker, this member is really way out of line here. This government has moved to help workers on many occasions, including the targeted initiative for older workers. We've extended unemployment benefits, Mr. Speaker, uh, in areas of high unemployment. And in this case, Mr. Speaker, I can guarantee the member that this is a fair process and that people will be treated fairly. And overwhelmingly, as I pointed out earlier, workers are able 
able to get benefits. I would urge the member to let the process take its course. That will conclude uh, the question period for today. I would like